Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. We are here today to talk about Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Preview embargo on this title has just lifted and so I can give you my first impressions. They are going to be very first impressions because I haven't played through much myself, only the first chapter and obviously I've got a long way to go with it but I want to take my time and really absorb myself into this world because I think there's a lot there and I don't want to rush it. So this is my very first impressions, but based on that, I think this might just turn out to be the strongest Xenoblade Chronicles of the, the trilogy. It certainly has a lot going for it. It's got me thinking immediately. There's a lot to think about about this game, actually, and I think as it delves into its themes a lot more, we're going to have a, a, a game that is genuinely thinking in nature. And the other two were as well in their own way, but this one seems to, at least at the start, it it is pushing its themes in a lot more nuanced way. Now I've had a bit of a checkered history with Xenoblade Chronicles. I didn't really get it the first time around. So back when the original released on the Wii, I gave it a pretty negative review on a website that's not around anymore and people let me know what they thought about that, but it just didn't hook me in. I don't know if it was just the place I was at at that time when I reviewed it or what was going on, but uh, it just didn't appeal at all. So then I replayed it on the 3DS, and though the 3DS version was a downgrade visually and whatnot, having that chance to re-experience the story made me realise that there was a lot there that I missed the first time, and I loved it. I thought it was an excellent game at that point. So when the Definitive Edition, or whatever they called it, on the Switch came out, I was just completely lost in it for the third time that I played it through. And these days I talk very highly of it as one of the more spectacular examples, I guess, of the genre. Xenoblade Chronicles 2, I found to be a pretty radical departure from the first in a lot of ways. Mechanically, it was vaguely sim similar in, the, in terms of the way it played, but the atmosphere and the tone of it was very different. And people talk about the fan service a lot. I enjoyed the fan service, but it was different to the original one, which had some elements of that. It was horny in a couple of ways or a couple of different points, but with two, they kind of refocused, <laughs> and it was a very horny game through a lot of it. And it, it was enjoyable for what it was, but I thought it was a bit of a departure. I gave it a pretty positive review, but I don't think I felt that it was what I would have expected from a Xenoblade Chronicles sequel. So this one here, right from the start, it feels like a proper sequel to Xenoblade Chronicles 1, to the point that you'd almost think 1 and 3 are kind of direct, you know, one to the next, and then two is a kind of spin-off. It almost feels like a Final Fantasy X2 in comparison to the uh, the link between one and three. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 feels very, very similar to the first one. It has a little bit of the horniness in it. Uh, I would be interested to see if people chalk this up as a kind of a downgrade on the fan service or some kind of capitulation to uh, criticisms of the fan service in the second one. I don't think that's the case at all. I think they just went out to make a more sombre-toned uh, JRPG that was more closely and more directly related to the first. It has a lot of themes going from it, for it right from the start. And again, I haven't played too deeply into Xenoblade Chronicles 3, so I don't know how any of this is going to play out. But immediate, And I should also say that I haven't experienced any of the kind of promotional material for this game as well with JRPGs or anything that's really narrative-heavy I like to go in as ignorant as possible. So I don't tend to watch the trailers. I don't read the press releases. I, I see the art, so I know that the game's on the way. But I don't tend to follow it that closely, unless I absolutely have to for reporting or whatever. I haven't had to do much with Xenoblade Chronicles 3, so I knew nothing about this game going into it. And so immediately on starting the game up, I saw things that were raising flags as points of interest and themes that I'm sure will come back at some point and will be explored in an interesting way. So, for example, the f military force that you are part of, or your team is part of, are using machines of war that have faces very similar to the nominal enemies of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, and I don't want to go into spoilers with all, all of that and explain what they were, but the masks, the, the robots are wearing masks that are very similar, and that immediately kind of sets off a flag that, hey, you know, there might be more to it than these guys are just heroes doing heroic things. 
which was great. Um, and then there was this, the, the explanation about what actually happens to the characters is fascinating too. And that's what I want to spend most of the rest of this video talking about, because if it is the dominant theme of the game, then I'm going to be thinking about this for a, for a long time to come. Basically, all the people in this society, which is a military society, everything about life for these people is their participation in the military, whether they're on the front lines doing the fighting or they're working on supplies or whatever. Um, it, it is all kind of focused around what they're doing for the military apparatus. And every single person in this society has a 10-year lifespan. It's capped at that. So if they don't die on the battlefield, which is likely, if they actually get to 10 years, then they get sent off in a, a kind of sending ceremony which turns them into this manner like dust. And the implication is that they get absorbed back into the society and, um, you know, uh, their chapter or their... It's kind of a thing to celebrate. It's not a death as such. It's an achievement to get to that point and everybody comes out and they get it, they have a big ceremony and it's kind of this really slightly creepy but certainly very nobly presented scene. So the reason this is interesting is this is kind of cuts very much to the core of Japanese society and the, the dust that I saw reminded me a lot of kind of... Um, the sakura blossoms as they fall off the trees. So if you know anything about Japan, I'm sure you're aware of the cherry blossoms or sakura blossoms, you might or might not know that they have a very, very short time to bloom. It's literally one or two days and then uh, on either side, you're not going to get much of an experience because the flowers haven't properly budded yet or they're already falling off the trees and the trees themselves are quite barren. You only get a two-day window. So if you ever decide to go to Japan to try and see the sakura blossoms you kind of have to go for a very long window because depending on the weather and the way things pan out that year you may or may not be lucky to see them if you go the time that's kind of designated as the best time to go to see them uh, that's happened to me before i've been in japan and missed them because they bloomed late and another time i just happened to be there when they bloomed and that was a, a really lovely experience but one of the point of this is because the bloom is so short this has become very important to the Japanese culture because it reminds them of life itself and how short life is. Obviously, we're on the planet for 80 to 100 years, which is a lot longer than one or two days, but they see a parallel there that it, it kind of, it's a spark that ignites and then it quickly burns away. And that's something that's common to a lot of cultures, but the Japanese have turned it into this really symbolic thing through the sakura blossoms with an aesthetic to go with it, which is the blossoms kind of floating through the air. And, you know, you if you watch enough Japanese television and movies, you'll see that re, uh, reoccur as a theme over and over again, usually when they're having discussions about life and death and stuff. So the parallel that I'm seeing with the way the sendings work in Xenoblade Chronicles 3 suggests to me that this is going to be a major theme through the game. I would suspect, without knowing, I haven't played past the first chapter, remember, but I would suspect, given that it is a JRPG and therefore quite lengthy and your characters are approaching 10 years at the start of the story, they're going to escape their, um, their tradition, their military unit in some way and then go on a journey of discovery where they'll realise that this 10-year thing is a construct in some way and it's probably a little bit more sinister than any of them thought. That would be my prediction for what happens with the story. But... Within that, there's a lot of room for the developers to explore ideas about mortality and in linking to the military as well, the idea that you would take this thing as precious as life and throw it into a meat grinder because in this game, people are kind of, or the society, societies are being um, depicted as being in eternal conflict. All they're doing is fighting back and forth and... Yeah, the, the idea that humans are, or people are a resource to throw into this war machine is certainly a topic of relevance to our modern society. And this may be an avenue for the developers to explore that, which would be certainly interesting and in-depth and invigorating and uh, quite potentially quite intelligent. The other reason I think that this game will be quite smart about it all is because the other games are quite smart. Xenoblade Chronicles 1... I think I missed a lot of the themes the first time I played it and that might have been the underlying reason I didn't enjoy it that much. 
when I played it a second time and third time and really started to think about what it was actually telling me, it was telling me a lot. It's a pretty intense and intelligent game. Xenoblade Chronicles 2, once you cut through the fan service, is much the same. They're very smart games with a lot to say. I would suspect that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 will also be a very smart game with a lot to say. So that is my initial impressions. Uh, it plays very much like Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2 at this stage, which is fine. They do seem to have streamlined the equipment system a little bit, which I don't know if I'm totally on board with, but it may well open up as the game goes on. Uh, the characterization, the plot, the, 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 the storytelling and the, uh, the, the performances are all very good. Um, <laughs> they've got English accents. I'm waiting for the Aussies to come along. Apparently there are Aussie accents in the game, but I haven't encountered them yet. But if they're anything like how great they were in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, I'll be all on board with that. So the presentation's quite nice. It doesn't look quite as beautiful as I think I might have expected. But again, I'm kind of playing in a, this. The first chapter takes place in a very rocky, barren place. So it may well open up and become more beautiful. The draw distances are, of course, gorgeous. And the sense of openness about the world is lovely. But yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a game that seems to be going for scale rather than detail at this stage. It's still very attractive on the eyes, but I'll see how the environments play out from here. Other than that, though, I, I think this is just a really great game. It plays nicely. The combat's fluid, as you would expect. The performances are great. And there is just this overwhelming sense that there's going to be a lot to think about and muse about as you play on. So look forward to this one. I'm sure pretty much everybody that's on this channel already is. But if you had question marks over it, if you were unsure if they were going to be able to capture lightning three times in a row, you can put those to rest. This is going to be a very good game, I am sure. I doubt there'll be a catastrophe after the first chapter where everything falls down. So you can safely go out and pre-order this one, I would say. If you're a JRPG fan, if you're not, then I don't know. I would still suggest you go out and pre-order it. Uh, I, one final thing I will say, you probably do want to have played the first two before you play this one. They're both available on the Switch. <laughs> They're a lot... They're quite long games, so you've got to do a lot of gaming before this one comes out if you want to play it at launch. But it is directly linked to the previous two games. It would help you to have those in mind as you start to play this one so you can notice some of the references like I have. Uh, but the story itself does seem to be self-contained as well. So if for whatever reason this is your first Xenoblade Chronicles, then you will still be able to follow along with the narrative and the gameplay and stuff. Anyway... That's enough for this video. Do let me know your own thoughts if you're looking forward to Xenoblade Chronicles 3. I would be very keen to hear your thoughts. And other than that, look forward to my review when it comes later on in the month. Thanks very much as always, and we'll see you next time.